This is the second class of the seerah. And in the last class, we talked about the society and the place where the Prophet Sallallahu was before the revelation, before even he was born. And what kind of people were the Arab people? And we mentioned the good side of them and the bad side of the, of the Arabs back then, before Islamic, uh, before Islam as a religion in the times of Jahiliyyah. And today we're going to talk about a very, very important year that uh, is considered in Islam. And it is mentioned in the Quran. And this year was so significant that the Arabs back then used to uh, mention that year when they want to mention any kind of incident that happened. You know how we have uh, Dubai Mall? If you want to like describe something to someone, you say, it's near Dubai Mall. Say, ah, okay, I know. You know what I mean? And this year was like that for the Arabs. It was the year of the elephant, Amul Fil. And a lot of incidents happened in that year. But before that, I just want to mention to you the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which was his, his father and his grandfather and, and the whole lineage of it. They have three chains or lineages that the historians and the people who documented the lineage of the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam, they had three parts of it. One part is authentic and two other parts were not so authentic. The first part of the lineage is that his name is Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, Ibn Abdul Muttalib, Ibn Hashim, Ibn Abd Manaf, Ibn Qusay, Ibn Kilab, Ibn Murrah, Ibn Ka'b, Ibn Lu'ay, Ibn Ghalib, Ibn Fihr, uh, Ibn Fihr, Ibn Malik, Ibn Nadar, Ibn Kinana, Ibn Khuzayma, Ibn Mudrika, Ibn Ilyas, Ibn Mudar, Ibn Nizar, Ibn Ma'ad, Ibn Adnan. This is the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when it comes to the, to the men. And I want you to focus on the first three names. We have to lear learn them because the incidents happen on them. What we're going to talk about happened with these three uh, people. Muhammad ibn Abdullah, who's his father, ibn Abdul Muttalib, his grandfather, and his great-grandfather, ibn Hashim. The second lineage goes back to Ibrahim alayhi salam, from Adnan until Ibrahim. And this is not very authentic, but some of the historians wrote about this. I need to keep track of time. How much time do we have? One hour, right? Huh? How much? 47 minutes? Okay, thank you. The third uh, chain of lineage is from Ibrahim alayhi salam until Adam alayhi salam. So they want to, they say that the connection or the lineage of the Prophet comes back from, uh, goes back from the Prophet until Adam alayhi salam. So when it comes to Hashim, the great grandfather of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, no doubt that the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam was carried through lineage through a very noble and honorable men and tribes people of Quraysh and the Arabs. And Hashim was nicknamed as Hashim. He was responsible to feed and to help the pilgrims when they used to come to Mecca, to the Kaaba. You know, back then, uh, today we call it religious tourism. So people go to travel to Mecca and to the Kaaba and do pilgrims. Uh, and it was known for that. And so it was a very honorable job and a task for Hashim to go and serve these people, serve them when they're going to do pilgrimage. And Hashim actually is derived from the word that he used to uh, yahshim, uh, he used to crumble or squeeze the bread with the broth, meat broth, and serve it to the, to the pilgrims. That's why they call him Hashim. They called him Hashim. And he was wealthy. He was well off and he was an honest man and he was known amongst his tribes people. Now, Abdul Muttalib is his son. There's a very interesting story of Abdul Muttalib. First Hashim, Hashim, his great grandfather, traveled to Syria 
one time. And there he was traveling, as they said that he was the first person to travel to Syria through the journey of winter and summer, as it was mentioned in Surah Quraysh, لِإِلَافِ Quraysh, إِلَافِهِمْ رِحْلَةَ الشِّتَاءِ وَالصَّيْفِ the travel through summer and uh, winter and summer. They said Hashim was the first person who have done this journey from Quraysh to, to Syria. He married a woman called Selma in Medina and he settled there with his wife and then he traveled. She was pregnant with his son. His son was called Muttalib. No, his son, sorry, his son was called, uh, yes, his son was called, uh, Afwan, uh, where is his, I, I kind of got lost here. His son was called Shayba. His son was called Shayba. And they called him Shayba, you know, back then in the Arabs, they used to call people on what they see on, in them, maybe a characteristic or a detail or anything like that. So they called him Shayba. Shayba means gray hair. He had some gray hair, so they called him Shayba. Now this is the son of Hashim. He was in Medina. Hashim died, passed away when he was in Syria. And his son and his, and his wife were in Medina. Hashim's brother, Has, Hashim's brother is called Muttalib. Hashim's brother called Muttalib. And they were always inheriting the serving of the pilgrims in Mecca. They were always like, you know, this family was known to serve the pilgrims in Mecca. He knew of his brother's death. So he traveled to Medina to go and see his nephew, who Shayba. When he saw him, he reminded him of his brother. So he cried and he loved him dearly. He hugged him and he kissed him and all that. And, and then he told him he was a boy. He was not an, not a, and he didn't reach puberty, but he was a young boy. He wanted to take him to Mecca. Why? Because his tribesman was there and he was serving the pilgrims. So he said, come with me to Mecca. He said, I cannot go unless I take permission from my mother. His mother said, I cannot leave my son like this. So he convinced her. Uh, he convinced her, Muttalib. His uncle convinced her. He said all his, his, his family was there originally from there and we do a very noble and honorable job in Mecca. So he has to carry the task of his father. She was convinced. So he took him and he went to Mecca. The people of Mecca, when he saw him, when they saw him, saw Muttalib and Shayba, the little boy, they thought that Muttalib got a slave, he was a slave. You know, back then slavery was okay. So they're like, oh, this is Abdul Muttalib. They called him Abdul Muttalib. So he said, no, no, this is my nephew. Anyways, that name stuck on him, Abdul Muttalib. And Abdul Muttalib also carried the task of his father that he used to uh, help out the pilgrims, and, uh, and was very honorable and honest man. Everybody loved him and knew him there. Two incidents that happened in the time or in the life of Abdul Muttalib. One second, let me, let me just switch off the comments because they're going crazy here. Uh, where is this? Post settings. Comment settings. There we go. طيب. Two incidents that happened. One is the well of Zamzam. We all know Zamzam. He was sleeping one day and he saw a vision, a dream, telling him, dig Taiba. In the dream, he says, Wama Taiba. And he wouldn't, nothing would happen. He would wake up. The next day, he would sleep. And he sees the same dream, but they come to him and they say, dig barra. Tayba means from tayyib, something that is good. And barra means something also that is good. Bir, like bir al-walidayn, barra. What is barra? He doesn't get an answer. He wakes up. 
Third day he sleeps, same dream. And he says, and they tell him, dig madnuna. What is madnuna? Madnuna means restricted. And they said restricted for the pious and the, and the, and the pilgrims, meaning Zamzam. Fourth day he sleeps, they say, a, a man comes to him and says, dig Zamzam. Wama Zamzam? He says, what is Zamzam? So in the dream, he was told of the location of Zamzam. He gave them indication or of where Zamzam was. As you know, Zamzam was dug at the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And then it was, it was kind of lost. So Abdul Muttalib <coughs> saw this dream. And he went according to the dream and according to the instructions to that place and he dug Zamzam. And it was there. Subhanallah, it is like Allah is preparing his religion for humanity. He gave us Zamzam. And no doubt he honored the lineage of the Prophet ﷺ to be dug up by the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ. When he dug up Zamzam, and the, the people of Quraysh knew what Zamzam is and the importance of Zamzam. So they came to him, they're like, okay, this is, uh, this is from the heritage of Ismail, the Prophet, and it is part of our heritage as Quraysh. So we have to take a part of it. Abdul Muttalib refused. And he said, no, I dug it up and it's mine. Now back then there was no government or anything. They take the land and anything. you dig up something, you find something, it's yours. Finders keepers, as they say. So he said, no, I cannot share with you Zamzam. This is mine and I want to use it and serve the pilgrims with Zamzam. They said, no, you cannot do that. This, this is, you know, uh, we don't accept it. So they were disputing. Then they said, okay, fine. We'll have a third person to judge. To judge who can take Zamzam and how can we divide it among us. They wanted to go to Sham, Syria. And there was a, a, a Rafa uh, or a fortune teller there. And they said, we will go there. Her name was Hudaym. They will go there and she will decide on who takes control over Zamzam. So he gathered 20 of his men, of his tribe's people, Abdul Muttalib, and the Quraysh also gathered some men and they traveled. On the way there, they wasted all their water and food. The people of Abdul Muttalib. And they were about to die. They were stuck there. No water, no food. So they asked the people of Quraysh, they said, help us. We're coming with you. Please support us. Give us some, some water to survive so we can continue the journey. They said, we don't have enough for you. We're sorry. We cannot help you. Abdul Muttalib said to his people, everybody be prepared for death, dig up your grave and wait there so we don't get troubled dig, uh, burying everyone. And it was, it, was, it was a ritual even back then in Jahiliya time that they bury people. And so they were waiting. Then Abdul Muttalib said, we're not going to give up this easy. Let's find some water somewhere. And subhanallah, while they were searching, they found spring, a pure water spring. And they started drinking from it, alhamdulillah, and they survived. Once the people of Quraysh saw that and saw how Allah saved him from his death and his people, they said, we give up. Since that you are, it shows, it is, it shows that you are a man of God and Allah protected you and saved you. And that is why this is a sign that Zamzam should be for you. And we give up Zamzam for you. So they, they went back. At that time, Abdul Muttalib had one son. He had one son. And that son was called Al-Harith. When that incident happened, Abdul Muttalib was very sad. He said, I don't have any sons to protect me and support me. See these people of Quraysh, they came and they wanted to take Zamzam and I had no power to push them away or anything. I just had to speak to them and convince them. So he was upset about that. So he did nether. 
an oath to Allah. He said, if Ya Allah, you grant me 10 kids, 10 men, 10 boys, I will sacrifice one of them for you. Look at the jahl, the ignorance. He wants to sacrifice one of his kids for Allah. And years went by. This is one incident. Another incident that happened to Abdul Muttalib is the incident of Abraha and the elephants. No doubt we know this, but let's get into the details of what happened. Mecca was a place that everybody used to travel for to do pilgrim, pilgrimage, even before Islam. It was known for the Arabs, for the people in Africa, for the people in Yemen, all over the place. The people just come to Mecca to do the pilgrims. In Abyssinia, there was a king, Al-Najashi. Al-Najashi was ruling also Yemen, and he appointed one of his people as a state governor or something to rule Yemen. And uh, of course, his name is uh, Abraha, Abraha al-Ashram. He was also a religious person. And of course, you know, Abyssinia were Christians. So he said, it's like competition now, religious competition. He said, he didn't like that people would come to, to Mecca for the Arabs to, to do pilgrimage. So he said, I want to change the pilgrimage of all the people around to come to Yemen. And I want my religion to be victorious over their religion. Which is of course, it was a distorted, customized religion of Ibrahim and polytheism, idol worshipping. Because as you know, as I mentioned before, there were 360 idols around the Kaaba and inside the Kaaba. So it was a competition between these two religions. Abraha said, I will build the biggest church in all of Arabian Peninsula. The biggest church ever. And uh, he called it Al-Qulais, Al-Qulaysa. That church had, he gathered gold, marble, silver from all over the place. And he made the Yemeni there, the Yemenis, the, 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 uh, the people there work so hard. As a matter of fact, if someone would not finish his job there, he would cut off his, their hands. That's how determined that person was, Abraha. And he even took some of the, you know, the palace of Bilqis, Bilqis, the, the wife of Sulaiman alayhi salam. His, her, her palace was there and he took much of the material from that palace. That was mentioned in, um, in Dala'il al-Nubuwa lil-Bayhaqi and al bidaya wa nihayil ibn Kathir. Tayyib, the church was built. And I mentioned before that the Arabs were very determined people and people of honor and people that they were brave and sometimes foolish. So one of the men, everyone knew about the church. It reached the Arabs. One of the men from the tribe of Kanana or Kinana, he heard of this and he wasn't very pleased. He said, they want to, you know, harm us Arabs and put us down while, while everybody knows that Mecca and the Kaaba is one of the known places for pilgrimage, I'll show these people. Imagine he traveled from Mecca to Yemen, to Sana'a. And he snuck there, he, you know, a big travel. It wasn't like airplanes or cars or anything. He went with his camel or whatever animal he rode. He reached at night he snuck inside the church, he was built and ready, he snuck inside the church, and he, and he did his business inside the church and made everything dirty as a sign of what? As a sign of shame, as a sign of disrespect that this church is nothing, and he left. The people there saw that there was a man who was not from Yemen, he snuck inside and they tracked him. They knew that he was an Arab from Mecca. Abraham knew about this. He was furious. So he said, I'm going to retaliate and I'm going to take revenge. He gathered his people and he gathered around 9 to 13 elephants. And he set up his army to travel to Mecca. And he swore to destroy Kaaba. 
While he was going, of course, the word got around to the Arabs and they knew that Abraha is coming, heading our way and he's going to destroy the Kaaba. And it was something that is sacred to them. They loved Kaaba, they respected it. It was their honor and, and, and you know, they loved that people come to, to Kaaba or to Mecca to, to do the pilgrimage. So some of the tribes there, uh, from uh, a man, from a, a, a chief of, of the tribe of Shehran and Nahis. His name is Nufail ibn Habib al-Khathami or al-Khathami. He opposed Abraha and he fought him. He couldn't beat him. He took him as a prisoner. He was going to kill him. He said, Abraha, please don't kill me. You might need me later. I can be your guide to your travel to Mecca. Back then you didn't have Google Maps, so they need guides. So he said, fine. He took him with him and they were traveling to Mecca. The people of at Ta'if heard about this and they were worried. This man called Abraha with elephants, he's coming to destroy something there. They, you know, sometimes the message doesn't come very clear. So they came and they faced Abraha. Abraha told them, I'm not here to kill anyone. I'm here to destroy the Kaaba and I'm leaving. You want to oppose me, you're going to die. They said, we don't want to oppose you. We just want to know. We have a lat. They had also a house of worship. It's called a lat. Do you have any business with a lat? He said, no, I want Kaaba in Mecca. They said, no problem. Then we don't want to oppose you. As long as you don't destroy our idol, we're fine. We don't care what you, what you do. One of the people in, in, uh, in, uh, in a Ta'if was called Abu, Abu Rughal. Abu Rughal came to him and he said, Oh, Abraha, I will be your guide. I will teach you or I will guide you where to go and reach Mecca. He said, okay, come with me. It was also mentioned that during their travel, Abu Rughal, this guy died. And his grave was, was there. They buried him there. And it was said, it's not very authentic, but it was said that the Arabs, when they used to pass by his grave, Abu Rughal, because he was a traitor, and he told Abraha, he guided him to Mecca, they used to throw, throw stones at his grave as disrespect because he betrayed the Arabs, Abu Rughal. Anyways, so while he was there, he settled in a place outside of Mecca, Abraha, with his army. And he sent a man called Al-Aswad ibn Maqsud. He went to Mecca to see the place and to maybe take some, some needs or requirements, food, whatever. He came inside Mecca and he took many things. Among the things he took 200 with his troops, of course, he took 200 of camel that Abdul Muttalib owned. That Abdul Muttalib owned. It was the camels of Abdul Muttalib. And the Arabs were very scared. They didn't know what to do. They said, we're not going to fight this guy. They knew that he had elephants and armies and all that. So they let him be. He took whatever he wanted and he left. And so then he asked, who is your chief here? Who is the person that's going to represent you, O Arabs, from the, from the tribe of Quraysh? So they said, Abdul Muttalib, you are the person who is, yani, can represent us and you are well known and you are serving the pilgrims. So why don't you represent us in front of uh, Abraha? He said, okay, I will go to Abraha. He went outside and is there time? We're good? Okay. How many minutes? Okay, we have time. So he went uh, to meet Abraha. And Abraha, of course, now he's expecting the ambassador of the Arabs to come to him to discuss with him diplomatically, politically, what's going to happen to the Kaaba and to negotiate. So Abdul Muttalib, when he came uh, and he saw him, he liked him. He was impressed with Abdul Muttalib, his, his, his attire, his, the way he looks, his charisma, his looks. So he came and he sat down with him. He gave him respect. Abraha came down from, his, from where he sits, his throne, or they call it the Sarir. He came down and he sat down with Abdul Muttalib. And so he wanted to discuss with him. Abdul Muttalib, when he sat down, Abraha told him, listen, I'm coming here. I don't want to kill any of you. I don't have any problem with you guys. 
but I'm going to, I need to, I came here for a reason, and the reason is I want to destroy the Kaaba. So Abdul Muttalib said, it doesn't, you know, he, he derailed the discussion. He said, one of your men came and took 200 of my camel. Can I just have it back? Abraha was like, uh, what are you saying? I'm here to talking to you about, I'm going to destroy the most sacred thing in your land. And you're here worrying about your camel? So he said a very beautiful statement, which is, of course, he said, Inna ana rabbul ibl. وَلِلْبَيْتِ رَبٌ يَحْمِيهِ I am the Lord of the camel. I am responsible for the camel. And the house, which is Al-Kaaba, it has a Lord, it will protect it. Tawakkul. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so he was very upset with him. He didn't, he didn't expect this. So he said, give him his 200 ibl, camels, and leave him be. Let him go. As he went back, what did he do, uh, uh, Abdul Muttalib? He went and of course he was very distressed and concerned and sad that someone is about to destroy the Kaaba. But you know, subhanAllah, when, when you are dealing with an enemy, they say, oh, never show your weakness. This is probably part of his wisdom, Abdul Muttalib. Uh, that he didn't want to show his weakness, he didn't want to you know, put himself down in front of him. Oh, please don't. He didn't want to do that. So he played this, this persona that, you know, whatever, Allah is going to protect the Kaaba. And he left. Once he reached Kaaba, he sacrificed, or we call that he let go for the sake of Allah, uh, some camels around the Kaaba. And he said, this is for the sake of Allah, hoping that when Abraha comes and he takes some of these camels or kills them, it is because it is for the sake of Allah, Allah will be angry with him and punish him, punish Abraha. This is a tactic that he was doing. Also, he went and he hung on the chains or the rings of the, of the door of the Kaaba and he started supplicating, doing dua to Allah Azza wa Jal. That, oh Allah, protect this, this house, this, your sacred house, protect it from the people who are coming and transgressing against you or against the house. And he told the Arab people, leave because something bad is going to happen and we cannot defend ourselves, we cannot defend the Kaaba. Just leave and go on top of the mountains and just watch what's going to happen. Hoping that something will happen, some Allah will intervene, of course. Tayyib, this is when, when they were ready to go and enter Kaaba, this is where the story that we all know happened. One of the big elephants, that was the, the, the biggest elephant of them, they was called Mahmoud. That was the name of the elephant. And Abraha was on it. He would want to go forward to Kaaba. The camels would sit. Yabrukun. They wouldn't move. They wouldn't bulge. And Nawfal, from the, from the Arabs who came and guided him, he was with them. Nawfal said, you cannot go forward to the sacred land. Allah will not allow you. And he ran. He ran and he went, joined with the Arabs in the mountains. And he's looking, everyone's looking. And they're looking at the, cam the elephants. They were not moving. The, the people of Abraha, they would move the camel, uh, the, sorry, the, the elephants. They would move the elephants to Asham. They would go and move. They would move the elephants to other, any other direction but Kaaba, they would move. But when it come, came to the Kaaba, the Kaaba, the elephants would not move. Then of course, suddenly as we all know, the Tayr al-Ababil came flying as flocks, big numbers of them, holding three uh, pebble size or hummus, you know the hummus, the peas, chickpeas, size of, of rocks. One in the beak and two in their uh, claws or, or they say legs throwing them and attacking Abraha and the elephants. And these were not normal. This is not something that is normal that happened. As a matter of fact, Ibn Kathir also mentioned in some of the narrations, these birds were unusual. They had heads of, uh, of other animals. Siba, they call Siba, lions. These are some narrations, they were weak. 
But the point is that there was, it was a miraculous incident that happened. They flew when they started firing at the elephants and the troops. And it was so hard on them, Tarmihim bi hijaratin min sijil, that it was so powerful that it, was, it would destroy them. Fajalahum kaasfim ma'kul, like leaves or like uh, crumbled paper that is nothing, you know? Asfin ma'kul, except for Abraha. Abraha did not die. Abraha fled, but Allah inflicted on him a disease. His limbs and his fingers would fall off slowly until he reached Yemen. Then he died there. For this was a sign all the Arabs were looking how Allah Azza wa Jal sent down the birds to destroy Abraha and his elephants and to protect protect the Kaaba. No doubt they knew that Allah considered this place as a sacred place. And this was the preparation from Allah Azza wa Jal that He willed that Abraha would come and He would show the Arabs what is the value of Al Kaaba and what is the value of dua to Allah. Even if you are a kafir, even if you are whoever you are, an atheist, but you sincerely do dua to Allah, Allah will move mountains for you, no doubt. But sincerely doing dua to Allah is something that is very hard sometimes to achieve. At that moment, Abdul Muttalib did that dua sincerely to Allah. And Allah saved and protected the Kaaba. And this was something a great monument that we today Muslims enjoy and travel to and worship, but without the idols, of course. All thanks to Allah and all thanks to the da'wah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now let's go back to the incident of Zamzam. We said that Abdul Muttalib was sad. Yani I had only one son and he made an oath, nadr, to Allah that if he gets 10 sons, he will sacrifice one of them. So Allah granted him 10 sons. The first one is Al-Harith, then Al-Zubair, then Abu Lahab. You know Abu Lahab, we all know Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab, then Al-Muqawwim, Al-Muqawwim, uh, Al then Dirar, then Abu Talib, we know Abu Talib, then Juhal, then Abdullah, which is the father of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then Hamza, we know Hamza, then Al-Abbas. It was narrated that Abdullah was the youngest, but it's not true. Abdullah was a third from the youngest. He was the eighth. Hamza was younger than Abdullah, then Abbas was even younger. So these are the 10 kids that Allah granted Abdul Muttalib. Now Abdul Muttalib said an oath, and we, saw, we know Arabs are very determined. They don't care. They'll kill their children. If they promise, they promise. It's a promise. It's an oath. So he came and he did Al-Azlam. As I mentioned before, Al-Azlam is when they take arrows and they write uh, something in the arrow. And it's like, you know, uh, what do you call it? A raffle. A raffle draw. Same thing. They put ten he put 10 arrows to choose who is he going to sacrifice for the sake of Allah, as he promised. He put the names of his sons. And he mixed them together and he pulled. It was Abdullah. He wanted to come and kill him. Everyone stopped him. So what are you doing? He says, I, I made a promise. I cannot. He says, no, no, you cannot. This is your son. You can't do that. His, everybody held him. He's like, I'm not. I have to. He said, no, this is your son. You, how can you just kill your son? That's, that's, that's inhumane. And so he said, okay, fine. Find me a way. Find me a solution to this. I have to kill him. Or else we can find a solution. So they went to a Arraf, a fortune teller. He said, find a solution for the man. We want to save the son, Abdullah. She said, replace your sacrifice with camels. Put 10 camels and put Abdullah, like in the arrows, put two arrows. Write Abdullah in one arrow and the other arrow write 10 camels or the camels. And go in front of 
Hubal. Hubal was a, an idol, Sanam, in Al Kaaba. And draw one. Let's see. The first time he drew, came Abdullah. He says, ah, huh? no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Add another 10 camels. He says, okay. Added another. So it became 20 camels. And back then, the fidya, the compensation for a soul, one man's life, was 10 camels. That was the Arabs back then. If you kill someone, uh, of course, unjustly, then the fidya, the compensation is you have to give that person, the family of that dead person, 10 camels. So the fortune teller said, wait, don't add another 10. So it became 20. Pull the draw again. It became, it came Abdullah again. So she said, add another 10. Pulled it again, Abdullah again, third time. Add another 40. Pulled it again, Abdullah again. He kept on adding and it kept on coming. Abdullah is to be sacrificed in the draw until he reached 100 camels. Once he reached 100 camels, he pulled it, pulled the draw, it was the camels. He said, wait, 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 wait. I have to pull it three times. <laughs> Let it go, man. <laughs> no, I have to pull it three times. He pulled it a second time, it came the camels. He pulled it a third time, it came the camels. He said, Khalas, I will slaughter for the sake of Allah, a hundred camels for the sake of Allah. And this was, in Islam also, it was confirmed that the diyya, the compensation of a life of one Muslim is hundred equivalent to a hundred camels. And this is also evident that some of the things in Jahiliya was there and it was part of Islam because Allah confirmed it. Sometimes even in Jahiliya, there's a lot of things that Allah confirmed uh, in Islam. Not that it's, it's bad and we know it was something that is good and compatible with, with what the Sharia is. So Abdul Muttalib came and he slaughtered a hundred camels and he left it in around the Kaaba for the people to eat and for the animals to eat and all that. And this was the story how Abdullah, the father of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, survived the oath of his, of his father and the year of the elephant was concluded. 55 days after the year of the elephant, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born was born and that's why everything that went around uh, the time of the year of the elephant was documented because of that year because of what happened with Abraha and of course the incident of Zamzam and what happened to the Arabs طيب, we will stop here and inshallah in the next class the coming week inshallah we will talk about the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how was his childhood سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أستغفرك وأتوب إليك. If you brothers have or sisters have any questions, please feel free to ask. With regards to the dars, of course. Very clear, nice story, clear story. Reminder to us of what happened to the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام. Yes, sir. Yes. What's that? Flipping a coin? Just flipping it or what are you doing? 